and we ask for the blessings of Allah upon the noble prophet Muhammad, his household, his companions, and every Muslim that follow his path till the day of resurrection. I mean, just as our anchor person has just introduced me, my name is Ali Mohd Sani And the topic we'll be looking at today is reconciling cultural practices. As Muslims in Nigeria, we are crossed in between we are crossed in between different cultures. And that is our African culture because that is where we belong originally. The second one is the Western culture due to our colonial past, the colonial experience we had. And the development, catching up with the development in the world. For us to be able to do that, then we are also tilting towards the Western culture. The third one is the Islamic culture because we are Muslims. And there are problems there and there, trying trying to reconcile because we want to be part of those that will say, okay, they are the elites. They know what is involved. They are doing the right thing. They are civilized. Now, in order to, de to, to, to define what civilization means, we want to go Western because most of us think that Western education the, uh, is a determinant of how civilized you are. But as Muslims, we know that we are not just limited to our sojourn here and not. We know that there is hereafter. And our actions here determines, our actions determine where we belong over there. How do we now make a reconciliation between these three different cultures? The African culture, the Western culture, and the Islamic culture. That is a major thing, challenge that faces uh, every Muslim, either consciously or unconsciously. And in order to do the reconciliation, based on my background, I'm a philosopher by training. I will be using what we call phenomenology. I wouldn't bother you with the evolution of phenomenology or the rest, but I will just tell you what it's all about and how you, as a non-philosopher, could apply it in order to reconcile these differences by phenomenology. We mean to reconcile something. It's a tool. It's a tool in order to arrive at objectivity. Have to be objective without being biased. Philosophers believe that, and as everyone will agree, there are basically two ways that things appear to us. It's either I see this phone as it is, or I, I see it as it is not. As an example, someone might be coming and say, Oh, that person is a man. By the time he moves closer, say, oh, what a mistake. Probably because he looks like a, a, a man. That was what, that was why I thought. Probably the person coming as a woman, it's a tomboy. You've missed a mistake like that. So, oh, that is someone. That is my friend coming. Ah, like, yeah, my friend. Oh, sorry, I thought it's Fatima. Which means that thing appears to you as it is not. On a closer look, we now discover that oh. It now reveals itself to you as it is. So which means things are basically two ways of appearing to you. Or presenting itself as it is, or presenting itself to you as it is not. Now in order to now try to resolve these discrepancies, we now the philosophers have now developed a kind of template in order for you to be objective and see things as it is. They now employ a tool known as phenomenology. 
Because I said, I wouldn't bother you how it's evolution or how they arrive at the concept, but I will just allow you how it operates, how you can make use of this tool. Even beyond our topic for today, which the main purpose is for you to be objective in anything you do, so that you will not bother yourself with the non consequences. So, to be phenomenological, you have to do two things. When you want to look, okay, let me give myself as an example. For you to be able to know who I am, you should forget the fact that maybe you've seen me anywhere before. Forget the fact that I'm a Muslim. Forget the fact that they have introduced me as a philosopher or as anything. Just for those who just try to forget all those information given to you. Anything you've known prior, before now, that I'm saying this, for you to know me, forget it. Just look at me as if you had no information about me. Because those information might color your perception of myself. So, oh, it's from Mercas. If so, if you are the type that belong to the Mercasis, you say, oh, those are our people. Then you you will you will want to support me, even if I'm going on. You feel because you have seen the affiliation that we have something in common. That will want you to do what to buy into my idea easily. And by by so doing, you won't be objective enough. So forget prior information. Forget the fact that you have any. Forget that, that I'm a Muslim. On the one hand. Now the second part is now removing from me anything that is not prim that does not belong to me primarily. Those things that are not essential. Remove all those things. Don't let them color the way you look at me or you perceive me or you think about me. Probably because I'm putting on a, a, a cap or I'm, I'm dressed. Dress. These things might affect the way you perceive me. I might be putting on just an ordinary t shirt. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that I'm not the same person if I'm putting on a very big uh, robe and a sky scraping turban. That doesn't make me a different person. Those things are secondary issues. So that is why at times some people will say, okay, uh, no, 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 that, 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 that case is not like that. I, I listened to a lecture from a big imam. In fact, you, you will see the, 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 the large perturbation. If you see the, the magnitude of the turban, you will know that you say something. That doesn't mean it is not the size of the turban or the size of the robe. But the size of knowledge that the person has to deliver. So, which means those things that are not essential, that are not primarily mine, remove them. And when I talk about the, those things that are primary, I'm talking about my head. It's, it is composed as a man, as a human being, as a head. Those are essential things. So, for you to say things, as times people will say, okay, ah, but the day I met this lady, she, she was very busy, very busy. Why is she? Because she had no do the making up, the branding and packaging. The other day, we have an opportunity to see her. A totally different person. Which means, for you to be able to see that person, you must be objective. Therefore, forget and remove, put in bracket, those things that are not essential, that are not primary keys for cash. I think with that we can understand what phenomenology is all about and the essential things that we need to Now coming back to to discuss this problem. Using these basic tools, using phenomenology and putting at least phenomenology as a parameter or as a yardstick of measuring these naming and uh, Maybe we add breathing. Try saying name it and breathing. The Quran said, who's who see that they have the from the message today? That we should a lot of uh, places there talking about the kind of way Allah I'm sorry, 
that we should be lower our gaze and there is controversy on that which one is covered, which one cannot be exposed, which one is exposed. But the bottom line is that we as Muslims we want to dress in accordance with the, the, the dictates of Islam and we want to look civilized. And we would want to appear in the way oh, you are from which home? Probably this guy or this boy or this girl is not from a decent home due to the dresses. How do you now reconcile? There are some things that we need to know that has nothing to do with Islam. We shouldn't forget that Islam was brought to us from another soil, from another culture. And there is no way if something, grow, uh, if something comes up, if you plant a tree or a kind of seed in a particular land, by the time it germinates, the type of land influences that the kind of things that come out. You should understand that. So when Islam was coming, it was also coming with the Arabian culture. As an example, it will come with Jalabia because that is what that's the kind of resident they put on. And you see them putting on turban. And that is why you see we Muslims dress the same way. Because the noble person or coming from that culture and the Sahabas and those who brought through whom we got this religion dress that same way. So it is natural for us to want to look like them. Even without compulsion, naturally. Most of us dress the way we do because we see people who we've chosen as role models dress this way. But it's not to the extent that people might even think, how can you perform so large with Ankara? <laughs> they say, no, 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 no. It, if they are thinking, they are talking, no, no. Salata is only permissive, it's only acceptable if you are putting on your jalabia. You know, in some words, you can't even pray. You can't even stay at the front row if you are not putting on the cap. So, now, where do we delineate this core of culture and religion? It is compulsory for us to cover our nudity, our nakedness. That is the injunction. But you know, it goes to the essay that some people will say, no, no woman must put on a trousers. Even if the woman is put on, is putting on a big gown as big as mine. You say, no, 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 no. The trousers is meant for the men. I will say the skirt or the wrapper is meant for the women. I will tell you categorically that there is no place in the Quran or in the Hadith that God mentioned trousers for the men or wrappers or skirts for the women. Is our society creation? You know, there are ways, there are places you should put the bottom if the clothes or uh, if the, the gown or the shirt is for a guy. Now, for, okay, the bottom should be on this side. Why, if it's not a female, the bottom must be on this side. That is societal creation. That has nothing to do with religion. We believe that the guys should put on their wrist, uh, their wristwatch on the left, while women put on their wristwatch on the right. And guys usually put on their wristwatch in this way, so they check. But women do it this way. So if, but eventually, not someone that uh, maybe a, a man that's not trying to put it that way. Like, oh, I feel like a woman. That's what you ask him. But this has nothing to do with the sex that person belongs to. So also we imported all these things into religion unconsciously. Now, even this, when we get some of us that have been to Hajj, at least that is the largest congregation of Muslims in the world. You will find out that when we get to Hajj, it is these women that put on trousers. It's now men that put on rabbi. Allah instructed men to put on rabbis and not trousers. So what are we saying? And maybe for 
nation. It might interest you to know that trousers were invented by the Chinese women. Because at that time, women usually go to the farm to work. Men are always at home drinking. <laughs> when they are drunk, the men, they will now go to the farm to rape the women. The women came together, but what do we do to, in order to arrest this, this situation? I said, okay, what we'll do is, let's design a kind of underwear that will make it difficult for them to rape us. That was how they invented and designed the trousers. So we men snag it from, we may say, no, we are not entitled to this. You shouldn't put on that. So that tells you what? That a lot of them mentioned Shokoto, no trousers, no skates, no rappers. But we should ask ourselves, what is the main uh, point that Allah want to make about our dressing? It's all about our immediacy. Someone might be putting on a wrapper, and yet the wrapper is as good as putting on a trouser. The wrapper or the skirt which you put on that is so tight that one could say almost with unless you say accuracy that this is a shape. Search a wrapper, search a skirt is not Islamic. So that we should know. Also, to men, we are not expected to put on things that will expose our nudity. We must cover our body. But yet, just as Allah has not mentioned a particular dress for us, Allah has not mentioned Jalabia. You know, most of us, that uh, someone of my breed, that someone that's no born, uh, from uh, born in an Islamic scholar's house, you know, those type of people. My grandmother was, was, a, was a noble woman. So that we usually learn uh, Arabic through the slates. We, know, we, we use the wala. It was after some time that we okay, we cannot manage uh, the, the paper. So you can imagine what it looks like. We think that there are some things are just part of it. How can you put on something different? From the ones you see the same scholar put on. If you the, we believe that the dressing or the, the material that should be shown by an Islamic scholar must be the best to be guinea. How can an, an imam put on a lace? That's ah, for a lace. Ah, and kara afwa. How can an afwa an Islamic scholar put on fila gobi? Abitiaja. For what reason? I say it's a taboo. And this has nothing to do with Islam. And yes. Why is it forbidden for women to be imams? It's because 
it is not proper for an imam, so to say, to be at the front of men while they are looking at a at the back. They will lose concentration. So in order for them to be concentrated, no, the women should be at the back. They should be lead. So also, the same concentration could be lost if you walk on the streets. So try to reconcile. That's for that. Uh, 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 that all the parts of our body that we use in worshiping Allah, that is the interpretation. No, I have objections about that interpretation, but since it is part of what is causing problem, I will adopt that interpretation for the sake of reconciling it and now fault it. It was interpreted as that all the parts of our body are meant for Allah, the, the part that we use when we want to do our sujud. And what are the parts that are involved? Our forehead, the nose, the two hands, the knees, and the toes. You know, it's forbidden for you to put your arm on the ground. It's not the arm, but this, the, your palm is on the ground. Fine. If that is the interpretation that's been adopted, it was now being transported, being extracted, to now justify the fact that you are not meant to do badly for your parents. You are not meant to prostrate. I purposely use the word probably because at times people parade ignorance as knowledge. If we were to interpret sujut in English, it would be prostration. That's what any except it is to be explained using statements. But if it's using a word we say prostrate. That shows the limitation of that language, that culture, that Western culture, because the language is the conveyor of culture. From people's language, the kind of things they have words to communicate, they, tells you the kind of experience, the kind of things that happen there. They are not the type that do sweet So they don't have exact word for it. Now those who now imported it that have read just the English Quran. That's why most of all that we have gone to the to the, the Babas who are fast to really learn in Yoruba, we really have problems with those that have just learned with the English text. No, this language cannot convey with enough accuracy for you to comprehend what is being said in Arabic. Because even Yoruba has limitations. It is when you have gotten to an extent, to a point, that you now begin to, oh, okay, ourselves has no other way to introduce this than saying this until you are passing this. Okay, as an example, how do we introduce, how do we interpret uh, evolution in Yoruba? Ishedale, who could say Ishedale is culture, is tradition. But evolution, something evolving. No, I couldn't have done better. But there are putting their best. Now, this limitation, we're now limitation we now adopted, we now. No, that is balance foot forward into interpreting Islam. Now, if that is the case, and remember, when you are doing something, I told you phenomenologically, you must try to know what is the essential, the basic thing that is essential when you want to follicle it is what? It's your forehead. If we only call it. Sujud. Any other thing you are doing, any other position that put yourself and your forehead is not touching the ground, that is not sujud. So, if we are prostrating to the elders 
Are we putting our forehead on the ground? So, I ask that so here. If I had to compel someone to put the hand on the ground of another person, I would have asked, I would have compelled the woman to put the hand on the ground of another person. So, if Idobale does not entail that, I wonder how it's now the camps and haram. If he put the kneel down to show respect as a form of salutation to the elders, only requires the knees and the toes, without the forehead. I wonder what makes it forbidden in Islam. And I do ask this question. If you say that, okay, whenever I kneel down, then I've assisted, I've assisted a partner with Allah. Then if peradventure, I'm on my way and I have now had a flat tire. And I'm now down to, you know, a screw. So am I worshipping the, the, the tire or the, or the car? <laughs> are we forgetting what Allah says? When he said, uh, what the old prophet says? When he said, in love the amen, be niyat. Actions that we do according to intention. I'm greeting. I'm not worshiping. And furthermore, when Allah had a kind of uh, test between the, uh, the angels and our forefather Adam, after the victory of Adam, Told my like, this to do the Adam. Is to do the Adam. Put down your head. Do make a sujud for what? For Adam. Were they worshiping Adam? It was for another intention. Moreover, Idobale or Ipule does not even entail that. And another reason why they ran into this confusion was that in the Arabian culture, we so now in the there are some things we get that because those women are negative figures, so it is wrong. But if someone has been an exemplary man. As a body of emulation, we say, okay, we name this person base in order, in an attempt with, with the hope that we want Allah to make him live such a life as the person we name him after. So, that is one thing. But that doesn't mean that that is all. There are some men that have no attachments with Islam, but they are only. And in their days. But most of us, you know, due to COVID, we got, due, 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 due to the fact that we can now, can now go on, online to browse, we don't even consult the experts on names. Like someone asked me, he said, uh, because we daily name ceremony, now I do not know how far. I've now said to the internet to browse the kind of name I want to give to my son. But what name have you arrived at? He said, arrived at. Abdul, 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 Abdul. 
But we also be careful with the abuse because I've been to a name ceremony that a child was named Abdul Jamal. But when you ask yourself, what is the meaning of Jamal? Jamal means beat. Or even if. So now, if you now say Abdul Jamal, what does that mean? The servant or the, the servant of, of beauty or the servant of a beautiful person. Does that. Jamal is Jamal Uddin. Jalal Uddin. That's why we say, I'm Abdul Sherif. No. And one of the common names that we have problem is with is, when you say, my name is Shakruddin. It's not like Shakruddin, it's Shakrulai. Shakru means someone that appreciates, that gives thanks. Are you giving thanks to religion? Deep this religion. But you are giving thanks to Allah, it's Shakrullah. Now, I think these are the things we do, and we don't think something is wrong with it. Now, I will, this particular one that I want to talk about affects the whole, Benyoye now. Probably some of you will have seen it on the Facebook. People saying, women shouldn't adopt the name of their husband. Their surname, before getting married, should be retained. That and they usually quote this verse in the own home, the Abai him. It's not to Azab. In the own home, the Abai address them with the name in the name of their fathers. And they will cite examples of the wives of the holy prophets. They say Aisha, is this Aisha means Abu Bakr. They will cite all of them. Saud Abu to someone. They will even cite the name of Khadija. Me to Hawaii. I mean it. Me to Wahab. They will, they will tell you that they are addressed by in the, in the name of their father. Their son name is that of their father. And the man also have also said that in the one whom they are by him, their son name should be that of their fathers. So they have now introduced that mentality, telling women. To change their name, the, the surname of their husband which they have adopted since marriage before this ideology came, to that of their father. This is causing problem. The failure of the back to status quo. Problem. What Allah is saying there is different totally. He's not addressing husband and wife. And remember, I told you, that is the problem of the Arabians, not us here. No, it is the culture of the West. It also ties with the Western culture. And you know, we have the highly influenced with the Western culture. And I'll tell you how we come about having the solid in our own culture. We don't address people with the name. If we are now to remark someone without mentioning the name, attaching him to, the name, to his son or his daughter, will say,
they will know that it's your husband. But they are forgotten that in the Western culture, if you are using the surname of your husband, there will be this prefix, Mrs. When you see the Mrs., then the surname is that of the husband. When you see Miss, then it means the surname is that of the father. So there is no confusion. And every verse of the Quran has a reason why, why it has been has a reason for its being revealed. That very verse referred to Zaid. The Zaid is an adopted son of the Holy Prophet. You know, all the uh, children of the Holy Prophet died in his lifetime. Died in his lifetime, except Fatima, who died six months after the Holy Prophet died. So, all the, few, all the males were no more. Since they were no more, Zayn was very close to the Holy Prophet. He said, okay, let's be calling him. Ah, you know, if someone is, is close to someone, he said, ah, I'm ah, a chairman. I'm a chairman. But just as the Christian we are, we are sons of God, because they are close, they believe that they are close to God. Allah said, no, I begot no son, no, no child. Just the same way, Allah said, Ma kana Muhammadu abba ahadin min rijalikum. Pray as no sons. Do not address anybody as the son of the Holy Prophet because there will be a problem. Not in the life of the Holy Prophet, but later. He might want to claim that since I'm the son of the Holy Prophet, everybody addresses me as that. And by, by such uh, standing, I am entitled to be or to occupy his seat after him. It's for a reason that Allah did not allow or did not spare the children of the Holy Prophet. Allah now said, No, in the own homely abide him. Refer to those. I, those children you adopt with the name of their father. If anybody no more labaja, to be. If it's not the biological father, do not address anybody in the name of that father. Do not cause confusion. We have seen many cases that the person, just as you were saying, you say, You are his slave. If his slave has been around for a very long time. We will not be saying, ah, well, are you, our ancestors, we surely judge. Who are your ancestors? You have your ancestors here. So, in you know order not to, to mix things up, not to get confused, either now or later, Allah says, in the old home, the Abba, he addressed them in the name of their father. There was this particular maid that lives within the command of the Holy Prophet with one of, with one of his wives. That lady secretly nurses becoming the wife of the Holy Prophet. He loves to become the wife of the Holy Prophet. But the Lord did not know what Allah knows. And uh, Rasulullah now asks Zaid, he said, ah, Zaid, you are now supposed to have a wife at home. Marry this lady. She agreed reluctantly. It was so obvious that she doesn't want Zaid. And Allah did that deliberately. There was now a problem. After uh, the solemnization of the holy matrimony and the Nekai stuff, she did not allow Zaid to touch her. Okay, no, 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 no. No intercourse. They now reported her to the Holy Prophet. That I wouldn't know what's wrong with her. She's not even allowing me. Said, okay. Rasulullah now called her to her down. No. Do the right thing. She is the husband. She now allowed Zaid to touch her. After that, there was serious problem that there had to be a divorce between Zaid and the lady. Allah now said, uh, Muhammad Rasulullah. Now you should be the one to marry her. I said, eh? Allah said, Walamma Kodo Zaidun Mini Awataran. 
that we want in Ghana. After Zayit have touched her, have slept with her, we now betrothed her to you. She is now yours. We now, we now give her heart to you as a wife. Why has Allah done that? Allah, Allah was doing that in order to make sure that you know it is impossible for you to marry an ex-wife of your son. Just to underline and emphasize that Zaid is not good Muhammad. It was a very challenging. So how can you, well, what will I tell people? You say yes, because I allow you to underline that Zaid is not your son. Rasulullah now married her. So the verse that they are citing is not referring to men or to, to women adopting the name of their husband. That's all it. So looking at these three aspects, greetings, naming, and dressing, you are able to see that there are some aspects which we have adopted as part of Islam. That is not it. We should start looking, using the basic. Ask yourself, this thing I'm doing, is it haram? Is it compulsory? Is it fun? Is it halal? Is it permissible? These are the things you need to do. Once they are not essential, don't, don't try to belabor yourself unnecessarily. Then you should be able to know that these things are not affected by Islam. This is part of my culture. It doesn't contradict. You know that it is not forbidden in Islam for you to dovale or to kule. You know it's not forbidden for you in Islam to you, to wear ankara when you want to pray. You know it's not there. Just the basic that what is the intention of Allah for saying this. Once you align that intention, then you're able to figure out what is Islamic and what is what is un-Islamic. Akule kule haza asekulai walafu. I had an opportunity to, to answer the question. It, it's actually a question, but let me put it in kind of contribution. I attended this wedding at Neki. The grooms are from um, out in Nado in State, while the, the brides are Yoruba from Kwara State. So when it got to this stage that, you know, the engagement anchor, we call the groom to come and um, prostrate and become an issue. There were a lot of the, the groom, the father of the groom and the mother said their you know, son is not going to prostrate before the in-law and issues came up. Until there were a lot of rancors that we had to go and observe the soul prayer, then we came back. And the the wife, the other, um, the father of the bride. I'm talking about the MD of an infrastructure bank of Nigeria, Kone Iloye. So, the both families are wealthy, and he said that you are not a better Muslim than her. This is a cultural state, and you have to. At an engagement. At an engagement, that you have to, if you don't do this, we will not move forward today. You know, and there are dignities. So, until a woman came, she's a doctor, and happened to be the elder sister of the father of the group. She came and said, what happened? What have you not considered? And they told her everything. And she just came to the front. She knelt down. And she has the boy to come and prostrate. And, and that was And that was So to allow for you to prostrate for that uh, location, there's a lot of time. No one regulated anything in the book. Now, what, are, what is Islamic etiquette of it? Yes. Uh, I actually want to make a contribution to my question. The fact that people have adopted uh, some culture into the religion, and it's not actually affecting the fundamentals, if they are still upholding it, is that a crime? Yeah, they are upholding the culture. Yes, if they, they, they have already adopted the culture and they have adopted it into the religion, so if they are still upholding it, like, uh, I don't want to persuade, and I have to go my family of my my wife has all been frustrating and they actually skip it. Is it bad? Likewise, uh, the name of the thing. If I, 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 one of some of these sisters, they know it is used to say if you erase uh, the surname or the name of your husband, they will say you should say Amina, your father's name, and, the, and your husband's name. Amina, you think? Uh, Amina. Uh, 
on them and stuff like that. So they used to do that. Is that was you are doing it. I just want you to make a clarification of that. If, if they are still holding it, are we supposed to be telling them that or speaking them that they are they are transmitting it or stuff like that? Thank you. My question was also, from what you said, you said uh, all this administration, uh, people who are not allowed, that's the taking of hands. But we are hearing from those that will start, that when they take hands, it's an alarm. And all those things, all those things, they give an evidence that it's not complete, if there is not your fault. How many parts? How many parts? 
pants is your prostration to your dad involved? Eh? Four out of seven. It is like ablution. If you want to perform ablution, you start from hand to go. So if somebody wash hand, mouth, nose, and face, and say you want to go and pray, does that make the prayer valid? Salam alaikum on that. Secondly, if you, like these brothers pointed out, we are not saying if you can do it and your dad agrees that he wants to shake your hand alone. He doesn't need you to go out for him. We are not saying it is around. We are saying you don't call others that do not do it or that are doing it. Don't call them shaitan. Don't call them kafir. That is the issue. I think I am making sense. Those that are still prostrating, don't call them kafir. If your dad is comfortable for you to open your chest and say good morning, daddy, good luck to you and your dad. Am I making sense? So, but for those who are prostrating, there is nothing around there. Don't call them kafir. That is the issue that you have for yourself. Because you have loved him in totality, you drop your name for his name. Why not? Isn't that the expression of God? But if your love stops and say, I don't want to go beyond this boundary, and your husband says, Why not? Especially when your dad is a prominent somebody, and that your daddy's name can be used to get open door, <laughs> open door of economic fortune for you. Then if I were your husband, I said, we could leave your father's name more. <laughs> because that can hang you for sure. For economic gain. It, that, it does not stop anything about your religion. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Finally, let us all point our hands. That's my own last question. Point our hands and we have to party up for you. It can gun you down. If you point this kind of finger to somebody in Malaysia, it can gun you down. It is an abusive finger in Malaysia. And that is culture for you. But here, in Malaysia, what do they point? They use this one. If you use this one here, what does that mean? You use this finger, you say, look at him. It's like abusing him. And this is what they use in that country. In Islam, I hope you are not expecting me to say it is salam alaikum, <laughs> and I hope you are not expecting me to say it is by handshake. Far from it. So far as the greeting in your culture does not run contrary to the fundamentals of Islam, it is permissible. Basic. Because some will say it is uh, Allah say it is salam alaikum. And even, have you, even when Christians see us and say, Salam alaikum, what do you say? They say, Wa alaikum Islam. We say all these things. And it is not Islam that says we should say, Wa alaikum Islam. If Islam is truly a religion of peace and enjoys us to relate with others, Muslims and non Muslim alike, then I see no reason why you should not. Spread peace, even with ordinary man, just saying it, you were reluctant. Is it you that cannot 
that are not spread peace with your mouth, that you spread it with your action, you lost. So, no one should expect I will say it is Salam Aleikum. Because this Salam Aleikum, we are not even ready to say it to others. And we should, we should try to understand the context, the motive behind what this person is saying. They know that that is our, our own greeting. And they are putting us our own way. Perhaps, but if, if you are able to reciprocate these things, they might, you might even entice them to Islam. That is that. Coming to back to that of Ikunle and Idobale. There's something in philosophy. I, I, I hope you may be offended that I'm using philosophy. That's my background. We call there's something we call uh, defining characteristics. Those things that 